This is the amazing Steve Stewart's computer coming to you from the basement studio. When I am not making Joe and OG sound better, I'm stacking Benjamins, AI style, and I'm not artificial. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today, let's talk retirement, huh? That's a new topic we've never talked about before. On today's show, we'll welcome the woman bringing us Retirement 101, Michelle Kagan. Plus, in our headline segment, a Navy vet just got a judgment discharging over $200,000 in student loan debt. Does that mean you'll be able to get your loans discharged? We'll ask attorney Leslie Tain. And, of course, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline and I'll serve up a piping hot slice of my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who could really use some 101 courses on hygiene. Just saying, OG. It's Joe and O. God, OG, take a shower. That's not nice. I'm very hygienic. I'm like the uh, George Carlin joke about hygiene and speaking of my colon i want you to know i don't automatically wash my hands every time i go to the bathroom okay can you deal with that sometimes i do sometimes i don't you know when i wash my hands when i shit on them that's pretty disgusting <laughs> he goes on to say that that happens only once or twice annually so <laughs> It's always the start of a bad day, but it's a good day here on Stacking Benjamins because it's Wednesday, OG, and we got Michelle Kagan here taking us back, resetting. You know how, like, they reset the Spider-Man thing? Oh. They reset Superman. Now we're resetting retirement. Michelle Kagan, Retirement 101 on today's show. And if you're at 101, by the way, and you want to get to 201 with your company, with your staff... Big thanks to Indeed for supporting Stacky Benjamins. If you're hiring with Indeed, you can post a job in minutes, set up screener questions, then zero in on your shortlist of qualified candidates and use an online dashboard. Get started today at Indeed.com slash SB. Also, thanks to Motley Fool for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Motley Fool Stock Advisor provides two stock recommendations every month. To kickstart your 2020 financial goals, Motley Fool's offering five of their favorite stock picks for free at fool.com forward slash SB. It's fool.com slash SB. Great show today. We're talking with Michelle Kagan. We got Leslie Tain coming down to help us talk about a crazy story. You know how you've heard that student loans can't be discharged? Somebody got it done. Got it done. We'll talk to Leslie about how that happened. But first, we got another headline, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Investment News and is written by Ryan W. Neal. Cryptocurrency trading platform introduces separately managed accounts for digital assets. Cryptocurrency trading platform SFOX is introducing separately managed accounts and hopes it'll help advisors manage digital assets on behalf of clients. The SFOX SMAs enable advisors, fund managers, and other financial services providers to design and administer personalized cryptocurrency trading strategies for clients and manage them from a single location. Holy Pla crap is this, dog. <laughs> That's I, That's the, I'm like, who's begging for this? <sighs> Goodness. Who is, but hey, here's what I'm going to do. Let's take all your cryptocurrency. Let's dump it in one place. Day trade the hell out of it. Because that's what a good advisor tells people to do. It's impressive. By taking care of middle and back office work, SFOX head of growth, Daniel Kim says he hopes the platform can help more advisors wade into the cryptocurrency market. No, Daniel, you know why they're not going there? Because you don't tell your clients to do that. That's why. And before we get emails, about us not understanding cryptocurrency, I don't think it's about that. It's still OG. It's still a bet, even though it did phenomenally well last year and everybody got killed the year before that. There were some accidental multimillionaires the year before that. It's the Wild West, man. I saw this tweet 
it wasn't about crypto, it was about a stock. But anyways, the tweet said, just because your bet paid off doesn't make it a good decision. It was still a bet. Still a bet. You know, so you can go to, and I just think about that. Yeah, you can go to Vegas and say, I think this person's going to win the Heisman next year, or I think this team's going to win the Super Bowl or whatever. And you could pick a team like the Lions and it might pay off. But it probably won't. A thousand to one. <laughs> yeah, but if it does, it doesn't make it not a bet. It it's was still, still a, a bet. wild bet. So I uh, love when we had our mutual friend David Stein on, and he was talking about the difference just between a bet and an investment. When he talked about investment, he said, you have a track record in earnings that you can measure. If you have OG earnings that you can measure and a marketplace that will show you based on these earnings, what people are willing to pay and an expected payout that we can track. Right. And then we can decide if we think that assets valued fairly or not, then we have an investment. And he talked about how things like even oil is speculation. If you're buying an oil commodity, it's speculation because of the fact that you're betting on what the future price is going to be. So if oil is speculation, I mean, think about what a crypto is. What are you going to base that on? What are you going to base your decision making on? It's a rhetorical question, I hope. Just, just, just Well, I mean, I think if people might be yelling at their device right now, I'm basing it on the fact that this is the future. Well, maybe. Which one? How is it going to actually end up getting used? What's the tax consequence going to be? We don't even know that. But even buying dollars isn't an investment. It's, a, it's still a bet. Buying dollars is a bet. An investment is something that you purchase so that that thing is able to produce something, goods and services or a product or and ultimately produce money. Currency doesn't produce money. The value of it changes based on the market or geopolitical issues or whatever the case may be. But, you know, when you invest in an organization like Apple, you're using your money to produce goods and services. I mean, you can look at it from the perspective of, What's the future value of a Forex contract? What does it go to? Zero. You know, what is the future value of an options contract? It, it eventually expires. It's zero. It's a 100% a bet. That doesn't make it a bad bet. That doesn't make it unprofitable. That doesn't make it something that people aren't good at. It's just you have to know what you're getting yourself into. It remains rare, the piece says, for financial advisors to include cryptocurrencies in the investment portfolios they manage for clients. Just 6% of advisors currently have an allocation to digital assets and client portfolio. 6%? That still seems like a lot. Six out of 100 advisors are like, yeah, cool, let's do this. I wonder how many advisors have positions in, you know, rupees or... Yeah, I mean, it depends. Iraqi dinars or, you know, whatever. How is this any different? It's just a, it's a different thing. And we've talked about this before. In fact, I think we did it probably two weeks ago. There's a difference between thinking about the currency, so to speak, air quotes, and the technology that exists to support it. And the technology that exists to support it is actually pretty interesting. So that's the example of an investment, right? Yeah. So you go buy a company that supports that technology you're buying a part of an organization that's out there making money, trying to produce goods and services. Maybe successful, it may not be, but that's the difference between buying the quote unquote Bitcoin currency, I guess, and investing in a company that's helping develop, you know, the technology that supports it. Interest among retail investors, though, remains high. Oh, gee, it says here more than three quarters of advisors surveyed by Bitwise said they fielded a question from a client about crypto in the last 12 months. And more than a third said they believe clients are investing in crypto outside of the advisory relationship. Yeah, we have some clients that do. Yeah. Still a bet. 100%. And in our second headline, this one comes to us from Yahoo Finance. Uh, Listen to this quote, OG, from Arthi Swabminathan. I have a chance now to have a life. Well, that quote's not from him. That's from a Navy vet who won a watershed student loan ruling, and he tells his story. The piece reads, for nearly 15 years, U.S. Navy veteran Kevin Rosenberg owed six figures in student loans. But on January 7th, a New York judge ruled that the $221,385.49 he owed in student loans as of November 2019 was dischargeable. 
Under Chapter 7 bankruptcy, I have a chance now to have a life, the 46-year-old Rosenberg told Yahoo Finance in an interview. Well, I wondered about this when I read about it because I'd always heard that this wasn't doable and we're so happy. She just happened to be walking down the street, OG, as we were talking about this. Isn't this amazing? How fortuitous. Weird timing. Yes. Somebody who might be an expert in this area. Leslie Tain joins us. How are you? Great. How are you? I always love it when you're walking the dog by mom's house, right when we happen to be talking about this. How does that happen? Because I have a lot of dogs, so I'm always out. <laughs> that is that is perfect. So I was thinking while you're here, uh, if there's one person that might know a little bit about this, it would be you. This is true, right? That you normally can't discharge student loans, or do I have that wrong? So what we normally tell people is that you can't discharge student loans in bankruptcy because the test to do so is very restrictive. So most student loans cannot be discharged. There have been a few cases where student loans have been discharged, but again, because the test traditionally is super strict, we generally advise people that you just can't. Well, so tell us how we got this done. So this is an interesting case for sure, and it's getting a lot of press and a lot of discussion, not only amongst those for student loan discharge advocacy, but it's also getting a tremendous amount of discussion amongst attorneys in the bankruptcy world and and in general, because without getting too technical, this gentleman requested a discharge in a chapter seven. So uh, just to clarify, there are basically two types of bankruptcy that an individual consumer can file. One is a chapter seven, one is a chapter 13. In a chapter seven, you would wipe out all the debts in one fell swoop. In a chapter 13, it's a repayment plan over a period of time. This gentleman applied for a chapter seven and requested that his student loans be discharged because his annual income is less than $38,000 and that after his regular expenses, he's at a deficit of about $1,500. But understand there's a particular test called the Brunner test, B-R-U-N-N-E-R, for discharge of student loan debt as it was originally intended. And that test was created in a 1987 decision to determine what and how student loans could be discharged. This particular judge uh, made a decision about applying or semi-applying that test in the circumstances and, and granted it. It is my understanding that, obviously, Mr. Rosenberg is super thrilled about getting his student loans discharged. It was a tremendous amount of student loans also, about 220000 in student loan. A lot of it really stemmed from his law school debt. Yeah. But that will likely go up for uh, appeal. So the question is, if it's affirmed on appeal, it would definitely have an impact on other parts of the country because this happened in New York. But if it's not affirmed on appeal, which many uh, law professionals believe it won't be because of the way the test was applied or potentially misapplied, you know, it's likely it could get thrown out. So you, oh, you're saying he still might owe this money. Yeah. So there's a possibility that decision-making process by the judge was in error. And if that's decided on appeal, like any cases. So while it's encouraging out there for those with tremendous amounts of student loan, I really wouldn't go and try to file a bankruptcy just based on this one case. I think it needs to be looked at. And I think anybody with student loans should continue with what they're doing, which is trying to pay them back. And then seeing how the law really plays out here. I mean, again, bankruptcy is a really extreme measure when it comes to dealing with your debt in the first place. And so while it's understandable that those who are not earning enough to to meet those expectations that this is an option, I would, again, caution anybody who thinks they're just going to jump on the bandwagon because it could be overturned. (laughs) Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop paying my loans today, Leslie. It's going to be well, fantastic. Well, I get that. People are like, oh, well, there'll be a new administration in one day, so I should just stop paying my loans because eventually they'll just, you know, they'll just forgive all my student loans. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> do what you need to do now, and let's figure that out when the time comes. And it's really set in stone. This is not set in stone yet. So let's assume then, Leslie, that this isn't an option for people, but they still have this overwhelming student loan debt. Uh, where else do they turn? So there's lots of options when you have student loan debt. The most important piece, again, is understanding, do you have federal loans or do you have private loans? Under federal loans, you'll have different options than you will with the private loan. So it's super important to understand the difference. And so many people stumble when I ask them that question. They really don't know, you know, who's backing the loan. So you find out first what it is. And then you need to see if it's a federal loan, you may be 
there may be a ton of different options. An income-based repayment, which could be zero if your income is so low. You can have a forbearance or deferment option where you just push it off further until you're either earning money or you're in a position to apply for more income-based. If you're working in the public sector, I mean, this is one of the myths on student loans where you talk about the forgiveness program. The forgiveness program is available on federal student loans, not private student loans. So understand also that your employer has to qualify for that and you have to certify that loan every single year for the 10 or 15 or 20 years that it's being repaid. So you need to check early on. And if you're working in a public sector, see if your employer qualifies. And if your employer does qualify, then get on that bandwagon because that's a great way to get your student loans discharged. Absolutely. Private loans. Go ahead. No, that's no, that's all right. I'm, I'm just hallelujah. (laughs) Right. So there are options. I I had student loans too. So when I graduated from law school, I had a huge amount of student loans. I wasn't earning any money as a, as a new lawyer. I was lucky I had a job and they wanted me to pay like a thousand dollars a month in student loans. I was like, I can't even cover my cleaning bills for my suits. So you think I could pay that? So I totally understand where people come from and they don't, they can't pay the student loans, but don't be discouraged when you're young. You're not supposed to have money and you're in debt because you paid for your education to the best you can and try to find ways to make it work for you and don't let it stress you out and overwhelm you. On the private student loan side, there are ways to refinance those to try to get the interest rates down. But if you don't qualify for that, try to work with your student loan servicer. And honestly, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work and you can't pay it and they're unwilling to work with you, they really can't get blood from a stone. So let it go. And you you can talk to somebody like myself or somebody else who's a real professional in the student loan world arena, but there are so many options. So please, you know, please don't be discouraged when you have student loans. Well, and that's what I was going to say, Leslie, was that I, I wish, I just wish there, let's pretend for a moment that there were a woman who really knew a lot about this, had a team of people who could work with people on their debt. No such place exists. I'm sure. That would be amazing. And in fact, that place does exist at the Tain Law Group. Say it's not you, so. It is so. So we have we do have a team of people. And really, I've been doing the student loan stuff for over 20 years, and I completely understand it. The understanding student loans is really difficult. And even when I graduated from law school, I didn't understand any of this. So don't beat yourself up if you don't understand what all the language means in the student loan world. It's super confusing. But, you know, circling back to the bankruptcy piece, It is an option if it poses an undue burden. But again, when you're young, I'm going to caution you about that because bankruptcy stays on your credit report for 10 years, and that's a big impact. And if you're looking for jobs and you're doing other things, it will absolutely and could impact your ability to get certain licenses. It'll increase certain rates. You'll have to check the box that you file for bankruptcy. So while things may seem really difficult now when you're on the younger side and you're not earning a lot of money, I promise you that changes as your career grows and you'll be able to come into more money and be able to pay it down at some point. I wish you were passionate about this. If you had a little (laughs) bit, that would, that would help your case here, Leslie. So, yeah. So if anybody could be passionate about student loans and I know that, you know, it's so dry for most people and they're like, oh, my God, don't talk to me about student loans. But I'm like, OK, let's talk about student loans. I get super excited. I bet Leslie's super fun at the holiday party circuit, OG. Oh, especially if you start <laughs> drinking and you want to talk about student loans. Drug student loan discussion. And then this interest rate was at 6.375%. Wait, wait, amazing. where are you going? I'm only halfway done. Right. <laughs> Leslie, happy new year. Great talking to you again and go walk the dogs. Yeah. Great talking to you guys. <laughs> happy new year. So nice to see you. How about that, OG? Leslie Tain. Student loan expert extraordinaire. It's almost like she was saying, if you have a specific problem, you should find a unique solution that's specific to you rather than a generic solution. Don't you think that's crazy talk? Nah, no. It's almost like, like if you were hiring people, you would go through this process to find the right person and for your unique Help situation. wanted ad in the newspaper. You shouldn't do that. No, probably not. When you start the hiring process, you might have questions like, will you find good applicants to choose from where, what about education experience and how will you know you've made the right hire? Well, indeed, OG, indeed is indeed here. Indeed. 
is Indeed here to help. Millions of great candidates use Indeed every day to find their next opportunity. I'm going to do that. You know, we were talking about uh, things so annoying. You just keep doing it. Indeed. I I've just, noticed. I just find that. You're doing a great I find it great very job. annoying. I find it very annoying. But every time I say it, I make myself smile. <laughs> Who knows? You can post a job in minutes. Use screener questions to help create your short list of applications. Your short list of applications. Short list of applicants. That might be better. Fast. Sponsor jobs on Indeed. Accelerate the hiring process even further. Boosting your post with premium placement and relevant search results. Helping you reach even more applicants. Indeed gives you the smart tools to make hiring decisions quickly and to be confident that you're making the right hire for your team. Post your job today at indeed.com forward slash SB and find out why more than 3 million companies use Indeed for hiring. Post your job today at indeed.com forward slash SB and find out why more than 3 million companies use Indeed for hiring. That's indeed.com forward slash SB. Should I do it one more time? Might as well. Indeed.com forward slash SB. I think the lesson here is uh, student loans. Maybe this uh, judgment is not the party that a lot of people thought it was going to be. I love Leslie's. I'm going to stop paying my student loans. This guy got him discharged. And even if you do, don't do that. Well, even if you do get him discharged, I love her point that, yeah, it's not all, not all butterflies and unicorns after that. You don't have a bankruptcy on your record. That's not going to be great for Ken or for anybody. And then our second headline, uh, separately management count for cryptocurrencies. OG sign up Can't today. Wait. Yep. You should only put 30% of your portfolio in it. Well, she has been here several times before talking about debt, talking about real estate. Now she's talking about retirement. She's one of our favorite people. Michelle Kagan is a CPA, an author, a friend of ours. She's a financial mentor, been in the business more than 20 years, and she is all over financial planning. Of course, we've talked to her uh, several times. If there's anybody who's always the first person to talk about when you're trying to get the basics about the basics, it's Michelle Kagan. So let's do that now. Time OG for Retirement 101. Say hi to Michelle Kagan. Coming down to the basement, the woman who, if we had frequent flyer miles for this show, she'd have a million of them racked up. We're so happy she's back. <laughs> Michelle Kagan coming to the basement. How are you? I'm good, Joe. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. Happy New Year to you, too. When you talk to your clients and the people around you about 2020 and about this new decade, are you seeing <laughs> are you seeing anything different with people's goals, with what people want for themselves? Is this like a time of renewal for people or is it same stuff, different year? It's different. It's like a decade and a year ending at the same time and people kind of look back on what have I done these past 10 years? There's just a longer period to look back on. And they, some people are like, wow, I've made great progress. I want to keep going. And some people are like, oh my God, you need to get me on a better path. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's a little more intense. This time. I, I even I feel the intensity, which is funny because you think about, you know, numbering systems are kind of arbitrary. Right. But still, yeah. <laughs> it still feels feels a lot different. Let's kick this off the way that you kick off the book. When I was a financial planner and you probably get this all the time too, people ask, how am I doing versus everybody else? And you dig into these numbers. First of all, you explain there's a big difference between average and a median. So maybe people need to explain that before we start digging into what the average person has. Explain that if you don't mind. <laughs> That's sort of a, a math nerd answer is that average takes however many people, retirement accounts they surveyed, adds them all up and divides them by the number. So anything that's like huge or tiny is going to mess up the average because that's called an outlier, a number that doesn't really fit in with the rest of them is going to make the average too high or too low. And be, you don't know what the individual numbers are when somebody's just showing you an average. So you have no idea if there are outliers in there or not. Medians 
a little better because it's literally the middle number. So if you have like 25 different accounts, the one that's number 13 is smack in the middle when you put them in order. Everything after that is $4 million and everything before that is $25,000. It's still the number in the middle, but you don't really know what the other numbers are. But for our case, because we're dealing with large numbers, if you really want to know the average, I think your point is that probably looking at the median number is going to give you more of a representative idea. Yeah. I mean, what we think of as average in this circumstance, median is probably a better picture of what most people have. Yeah. It's interesting. What you're really saying is, so Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are not going to throw off our number this way. Not as much as if it was an average. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's start off with baby boomers and we'll talk about these are people born between 1946 and 1964. What is the median household retirement savings, Michelle? Their median household savings for retirement is $152,000, which sounds like a lot of money, but for a 30-year retirement, it's not really. Yeah, that number to me, you know, having done a bunch of financial plans for people back in the day, been a long time since I've done one, but that number seems incredibly low. Yeah, well, when you think about it, if you divide that by 30 years, that's not a lot of money each year. So, I mean, I don't know what other, for some people that may be enough. They may have other things and just not a lot in retirement savings. You know, it's such a personal thing, or they may have crazy low expenses. They, you know, their house is paid off or something. I mean, for some people, maybe that could work, but generally for a 20 to 30 year retirement, that's kind of low. And just to give people an idea, you know, you use this rule, the 4% rule, which has been... (laughs) <laughs> it's been proven incorrect. Even the people that created it say it shouldn't be used this way. But if we just use that as a marker, if it's your only income, a million dollars is a $40,000 a year lifestyle. And we're looking at 152000 But to your point, if people have Social Security, a pension, other things, that may help. How much money are people contributing that are baby boomers on average? Usually around 10% of their salaries. And because salaries range so widely, especially in a group of people that many are retired already, 10% is also at that stage kind of low. Yeah. it's But it's funny. We hear often though, Michelle, people say 10% is a number that you, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, hey, save 10%, save 10% toward retirement. Uh, if you're a baby boomer, that number probably has to be higher. Baby boomers didn't start out with like 401ks and IRAs and stuff. They, it wasn't really a thing until they were a little bit further on in their career. So they needed time to catch up. I mean, 10% is what I tell my kid to save out of his paycheck for like stuff he wants to do. But, you know, and, and for young people, 10% might be a good number to aim for. But if you're 45, 50 coming up on retirement and you don't have a lot of money so far, is low, but it's 100% better than nothing. Right. right. Honestly, even putting $50 a month away, if, if money is tight, putting any amount away is better than putting nothing away. Anything. Your numbers are based on the Transamerica Center for Retirement Studies, by the way. And you write here that 9% of people put nothing away who are baby boomers. So big percentage there, 9% of people not saving at all for retirement that are fairly close to it. You know, you say that baby boomers, though, didn't start off with 401ks. So I think about Gen X, people in my generation, those people, Mm -hmm. I would think, okay, we've had 401ks the whole time. They're actually saving less, Michelle. You write that they're they're only (laughs) saving 8% of their salary. Right. But at the same time, they're also trying to put kids through college, buying houses. Like they have a lot of other stuff going on. And the thing about retirement is it's not present. So it's really hard for people to connect with a number that they don't know what they're going to need later. And the idea that they have to save up 500000 or a million dollars is so overwhelming that they shut down. I bet a lot of that 8% is what they started out putting in and they just never changed it. It was on like autopilot yeah. and they've never gone back and changed it as their salaries grew. I agree with you about the lack of urgency because I think, you know, I have a friend that talks about your lizard brain, right? 
Your lizard brain knows what you want for lunch. You go to the store, you can see it right in front of you, so you buy that thing. You can't really see retirement. So how do you, here's the real retirement 101 question, how do you build that urgency for yourself to take it seriously when it's so far away for so many people? Well, the thing is to try to connect with your future self, like figure out sort of maybe you look like one of your grandparents or something and think about if it's hard for you to put away 8% of your salary now, think about how much harder that's going to be. That amount of money is going to be when you're 75 or 80. Like, where are you going to get the money from? It's you're saving for yourself. You're doing this for yourself. So you have to, it's a selfish kind of thing to do. So you have to remember every dollar you put away, you're going to get back. You just have to sort of picture yourself older and thinking, wow, I sure wish I had that money now. I also think to myself, and I love that, by the way, which is when I was a financial planner, I'd tell people to get as detailed as possible about that future self, because that's when you can when you can really see it. Like when people say, and you write this in the book, that most people say, hey, I want to travel uh, I want to play golf. I got these, th- th- like that's nowhere near detailed enough. You got to be closer to the goal than that so that you feel it. But also the second thing is I'm as lazy as the next guy, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I would rather have an, I would rather have interest make money for me instead of me having to put the money away. So the earlier I start there, the easier it's going to be as well. Absolutely. If you start when you're young, you can actually put away so much less and still end up on the same track or with more. Yeah. Take the lazy person's way. By the way, the gen average Gen X person. So going back to this, the average baby boomer had uh, not average, once again, median baby boomer had 152,000 save. What about Gen X? Mm, 66,000. Yeah. Still, still feels like it's behind. Uh, well, yeah, and some of them are in the over 50 already range. So when you think about it. Yeah. That's running out of time. Let's talk about millennials then to tell them what median looks like. Millennials talk about dealing with other things, dealing with debt, maybe student loans, right? The yeah. epicenter of the student loan crisis. How much have they saved? Honestly, about the median is around 23000 and that's higher than I expected it to be. Yeah, me too. But that 23000 to me kind of looks better than the 66000 for Gen X because of yeah, the time. Sort of depending where you are in yeah. the age scale, it is because it has more time to grow. And they're also putting away more. So I think they seem to be like a little more on top of it, you know, realizing, yeah, I'm going to need to put as much as I can away even though I'm also still dealing with student loans. Yeah, the median retirement savings contribution rate, they're also at 10%, just like the baby boomers are. Let's transition from where people are to what should they be aiming for? Really, in the big scheme of things, does this median number, should it mean anything to me? Like, this is the question people ask me all the time, Michelle. How am I doing versus everybody else? How relevant is that? Not at all. Completely irrelevant. And yet you start, it is, it is. you start the book with that though, because it's what everybody wants to know. It is. Everybody does want to know like where they are compared to other people. But first of all, other people are dramatically undersaved, as you can see by these medians. You don't want to aim for that. That's not what your goal should be. You, you want to figure out how much you think you are actually going to need and make that your benchmark to measure against. So it's a very personal thing. And it's really hard, especially for millennials and younger, to visualize what they're going to want to do when they are retired or how much things are going to cost. But as you get closer, you really need to think about a person who wants to travel around the world 50 times is going to need more money for retirement than someone that wants to hang out at their house. That's already paid off. So the amount of money you need, it could be $250,000. It could be $4 million dollars doesn't matter what other people need. It matters what you need. I used to have uh, clients. One of my questions would always be, to your point, exactly that. So envision for me what this is going to look like. And they would tell me, and at the end of that conversation, they'd always say, but that's everybody, right? And it was funny because the answers were all over the board. They were completely (laughs) all over the board. And it wasn't everybody. Like, no, it's intensely interesting to you, but it's completely different for everyone. Speaking of that, You then next go to uh, the other side, people in retirement. And I think that people look at retirement as as one big, long journey, but you position it as three different parts of retirement. Why is that? Well, 
Because retirement's not one thing. You know, when you very first get started, you're kind of in a honeymoon phase where everything is fun. You haven't, you don't have to go to work anymore. It's, uh, there's a lot of new things going on. You might've just started getting social security. You don't have employer health coverage anymore. So there's a lot of changes going on. This is where people usually overspend because they're so excited and they, and they feel, you know, they're still younger and healthier and they just want to, you know, use money. So they often overspend in that first phase. You know, for example, somebody who thinks they want to golf goes out and buys golf clubs and joins golf memberships. And then they do it for two months and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. They've already spent all that money. You know, or somebody who books a world cruise and then gets on the cruise and starts vomiting, (laughs) you know, huh, I don't think I want to stay on (laughs) cruises anymore. Get me back on the ground. So it's kind of like a feel your way around time. And then once you've been in retirement, for like 10 years, everything sort of settles down. You know what things you want to do. You're done exploring. You're doing what you like to do. You're probably spending a lot of more time with family. And that change in activity level shifts the amount of money you need to pull for fun stuff, but it may increase the amount of money for groceries and electric bills and and just household oriented stuff. And then this is a time where you'll see how RMDs, which are required minimum distributions, have been affecting how much you take versus how much you want to take versus how much you have to take out. It's also the time when you want to start thinking about what's coming next, which for many, many people is a lot of medical expenses. Or even if you're relatively healthy, you still probably need help doing things like carrying groceries, shoveling snow that you didn't need help for before. It's important, just like we talked about for people saving, to think about what your goal is. You also list some of the big things people should think about. One big one you have in here for people early in retirement that people need to think about is losing that employer health coverage. How do you see people bridge that gap, especially if they're going to retire before the age where they get Medicare? Yeah, they can start by using COBRA from their employer, which is more expensive than the health care you were getting before, but probably still less expensive than any health care you're going to get because it's still at group rates. Some people, when they retire, are still doing sort of side gigs and professional like consulting things. And there are sometimes associations that they're, that they're in that they can get health insurance there or they can go through the exchange. I mean, really, that's, that's the options. They're not I don't want to get started on healthcare coverage because <laughs> the, the political <laughs> because aspects, right? Healthcare costs is a huge pet peeve of mine, but making sure you're covered is very important because this definitely, once you're uh, in retirement, that of course, when, even if you do a fire and you're retiring young, like as soon as you don't have health coverage, that's when something's going to happen. Of course. Yeah. And everything is going to take longer and cost more than you think it will. You talk about in the middle phase, at the very least by the middle phase, and probably no matter what age you are, getting your documents in order is important. What's a really important document people need that you don't see enough people have? I think power of attorney is something that most people don't think about and don't have. I mean, people are sort of familiar with the concept of a will and a healthcare proxy, but power of attorney is something that people don't really think about. And it's one of the most important things because if something happens to you, you need a surgery or something, your bills still need to get paid. You, you know, whatever things are going on in your life are still going on and giving someone that you trust completely a power of attorney, figure out, you know, pay your bills or make decisions about, you know, I'm going to cancel the cable or whatever that you can't make on your own right now, but that need to be made. It seems like no matter what age you are, having this power of attorney would be a good idea. Like if you're in a car accident, even if you're 25, 30 years old, somebody has got to manage the bank account, Michelle. Yeah. I I mean, I have one. Yeah. I've had one for a long time. Mine's my sister, somebody I trust completely. It has to be someone that you trust completely because When you give somebody a power of attorney, it doesn't kick in when you want it to. It kicks in when you hand it over. So, you know, make sure it's somebody you trust 100%. 
Yeah. And it's easy, by the way, for people to fool a bank teller <laughs> yeah. and, and, and get at your cash. I want to gaze into the crystal ball uh, for, for just <laughs> a moment, because obviously things are going to change. What about changes to Social Security? Well, there probably are going to be some changes to Social Security and not the dramatic changes, like there won't be any money kind of things that people are afraid of when they say Social Security is running out of money. What they mean is the Social Security Trust Fund, which is money that's already stashed. That's going to run out of money, but there's still going to be money coming in from people paying Social Security taxes. You know, that giant bite of FICA on your paycheck is what goes to pay other people's Social Security benefits. And someday they'll be your benefits. I don't think it's going to disappear. I think you're going to have to start later. Maybe the uh, the amounts will be reduced, but it'll still be there. Regardless, at the very most for Social Security, it's not an amount of money that most people could comfortably live on. So you need some kind of supplement for Social Security. So then I'm thinking as you're speaking then, based on what you just said, maybe the best plan would be try to, even though you think it's going to be around, try to make your plan so you don't need it at all, I would imagine. And then it can help out to whatever degree because it's hard to predict. Yeah. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, you can find out what your benefit is going to be if you go to if you make a My Social Security account, which I recommend that people do because you can catch mistakes, especially people who have side gigs or are freelancers. Because you need to make sure that that all that money that you're earning and paying Social Security tax on is counted in your account. You can see how much you're going to get. And they talk about, you know, maybe it'll be 80 percent of benefits, but you'll know how much you're going to get. It's just not going to be as much as you think it is. And it's probably not going to be enough to live on. So, yeah, I try to recommend that people act like it's extra money as opposed to act like it's the main money. You also talk about how housing is going to change, about how you expect robo-advisors to change. The book is Retirement 101 from 401k plans and social security benefits to asset management and medical insurance, the complete guide to preparing for the future you want. You, you go through everything from opening an IRA to uh, getting your estate plan done to, of course, senior living, which is a big business and can be, as you know, very expensive, can take a big bite out of your retirement this is such a wide topic. Was there anything <laughs> as you were researching for the book, Michelle, was there anything that surprised you? Cause you're somebody that's kind of seen it all right. While you were going through this, what was kind of a, wow, didn't know that. Medicare, <laughs> the Medicare stuff broke my brain. It was very confusing. I, would, I was also at the same time I was doing this, I was trying to help my mom figure out hers. And with the background I have and with all the research I was doing, it was so hard for us to figure out the best plan that I can't even imagine what most people go through. It's it's really confusing. And I feel like what's going to start popping up is like Medicare navigators who help people pick the right plan because it's insane. And, you know, I didn't even know this, that like a plan could change coverage in the middle of the year and just like you're out of luck. I used to cover this drug. I don't anymore. Too bad. Like, it's just so crazy. I had no idea. It's funny. I have a good friend, uh, Danielle Kunkel Roberts, who is on our sister show, Money with Friends with us a mm -hmm. few times. That is her job. Just advising people how, you know, as Medicare stuff changes, I mean, her company, Boomer Benefits, that's all they do. It's just navigate those waters. I could see I might have to hook her up with my mom. I know, right? It is, it is crazy. Half of that answer surprises me, but the other half really, really doesn't. Michelle, the book's available everywhere? Pretty much everywhere. That is so awesome. <laughs> it's great talking to you again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just found out that it's National Answer Your Cat's Question Day. Now, uh, where did Joe's mom's cat go so I can honor this special day? While I try to find him, I know the question the cat's going to ask anyway, so let's just get to it. Who spends more on their animals, cat owners or dog owners? I'll be back with your trivia answer and hopefully one that this cat's going to like faster than you can say, Rear.
Well, I got to say, I've been super excited to see some of the positive comments in our basement Facebook group about the Motley Fool and the fact that we've been talking about them on the show here lately. If you've ever wondered how to invest, especially in individual stocks or struggled to understand how to make your money work for you, the Motley Fool is just what you need. Motley Fool provides advice and guidance that cuts through the noise of standard business sections of websites and gives you a simple, easy to use analysis to help you understand the market. And I think that for me is the key. The more you understand how this stuff works, the better it is. Motley Fool was created by two brothers, Tom and David Gardner. They founded it out of their garage in Alexandria, Virginia, both still with the company. Tom's the CEO, David's the lead stock analyst and a board member. Their flagship service for the Motley Fool is called the Stock Advisor, and it provides two stock recommendations every month with daily analysis and coverage designed to help you beat the market. Regardless of beating the market, I love the analysis behind these positions. The Motley Fools become well-known analysts, identifying leaders and trends before they become everyday aspects of life. They recommended Amazon back in 1997, Netflix in 2004, and Marvel, of course, which is now part of Walt Disney in 2004. So to kickstart your 2020, your Roaring Twenties financial goals, Motley Fools offering five their favorite stock picks for free to stackers everywhere go to fool.com forward slash sb that's fool.com forward slash sb just like catnip trivia fans i'm back i'm joe's mom's neighbor doug and here is today's trivia answer get this stackers gotta tell you i've got joe's mom's cat cooper here with me and he's just staring at me and you and I already know there's probably going to be hell to pay if this question goes sideways. But here it is. Who spends more on their pets, cat or dog owners? The answer? Cat owners focus an incredible $915 per year on their cat. Hey, you hear that, Cooper? That's a good, yeah, that's a good boy. $915. It's incredible. God, you guys are just lavish. To... What's that? Uh how much do dog owners spend? You know, who cares? I mean, really, it's, it's immaterial. We don't really... All right, okay, 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 okay. Don't, don't have to get all twisted about it. Uh, it says here, and you know, we can't really trust the source on this one, Cooper, but it says here, uh, according to a 2018 USA Today piece, and who's ever heard of that, uh, that dog owners spend $1,285... Ow! Jeez! Hey, don't... Stop scratching me. It's not my statistic. I'm reading. The st- I just didn't stop. Don't call the messenger. God. Big thanks to Michelle for coming down to the basement. OG. you know, what strikes me every time Michelle comes in is how entertaining and fun just learning the basics is, right? I think everybody thinks you have to be an expert at this stuff right out of the gate and that you're afraid to ask the questions. But I mean, Michelle, so much of that is basic stuff, but it's fun. It's a good time. And now you get done with that, you know, 15 minutes of listening to Michelle. You're like, yeah, okay. Yep. Yep. And how many people don't even, don't even do that much. Build the pyramid the right way. Yeah. Take your time, be where you are, learn the stuff that you're supposed to learn, get good at, step by step and then worry about your cryptocurrency separately managed account. <laughs> it's crazy talk. Hey, let's throw out the Haven lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. I love doing this. Our friends at Haven life insurance agency, they put what you value first. And I think it's answering questions from our friends. So gee, that's what we put first. It's my favorite thing to do. Yes. It says it's your loved ones and your time. And we like spending time answering our loved ones, your questions. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple so you can hang out with your friends, with your family, and not be filling out a ton of applications. You'll find the application simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. Of course, everything's issued not from a uh, brand new company you've never heard of. Nope. Offered through Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old. Today, and uh, I'm not sure who that is, That's, that's from our last headline. I love it how Yahoo just, those Yahoos at Yahoo 
just play random videos. What's amazing is I think if that plays, don't they get paid on that even though I'm not watching it? Yeah, probably. Well, good for them because they just been paid since I opened that up when Leslie was here. Uh, let's say hi to our friend, Steven. Say hi, Steven. Hey, Joel and Obi. Long-time listener, second-time caller, and hopeful first-time learner. I'm a 23-year-old living and working in California. I dollar-cost average every month in my Roth and should not have any trouble hitting my yearly max contribution. I'm also putting aside between one to 2000 a month into a high-yield savings account with the intent in mind for some larger future investments. I'm extremely fortunate right now to not have many bills or expenses, so I'm trying to maximize this time to save because I know it will not last forever. Right now, I'm entering my final school semester, and as I'm getting ready to graduate, I see friends and classmates graduating with massive amounts of student debt, and it's making me realize how fortunate I am to have parents that were able to afford to pay for my schooling and allow me to graduate with zero debt. It's caused me to want to be able to provide this for any of my future kids as well. Looking into 529 plans, I see that the child has to be born already, but there are ways to put someone else as the beneficiary, and then when the child is born, switch it to he or she. Is this something that you've seen before, or is this real sketchy? I'd be willing to take a hundred or two every month out of what I put into savings to put into this 529. Is this a good idea or is this just overkill and I'm overthinking it? Also, if I do open a 529 now or in the future, are there any recommendations of what to put the money into? It seems to vary a bit online. I know OG always says that retirement is just a new phase, not a finish line, and that the money needs to continue to grow during retirement, but this seems to be a bit more of an actual finish line. Plus, the time span is much shorter than retirement savings. I know I'm not going to learn anything, but I'm just calling because I accidentally gave away my last 12 XL t-shirt to the Goodwill. So tell Gertrude <laughs> I need a new one. See ya. 12 XL. Steven's ripped. And it is ripped. 12 XL guns on that dude. Uh, Never skip arm day. Nope. Uh, hey, uh, so no kids for Steven. Still finishing school himself. By the way, congratulations on all your saving and for being proactive. That is incredible. But, oh, gee, what do you think? Open a 529 plan in a different name? Can you do that? Well, a couple of things that he said that I uh, don't want to gloss over. He said, I'm putting away one to 2000 a month in a savings account for future investments. This is just simply I'm saving money so that I can just dump money in the market. I don't know why you wouldn't just dollar cost average that into your brokerage account as well. If it's something that's a little bit more specific, like, uh, you need a down payment for a home or something like that, and that's specifically time bound. Then you know the cash is a fine place. But but if it's just kind of a nebulous someday in the future, I might dot dot dot. I don't know why you just don't put that money in the in the market as well, assuming that you've got your cash reserve done. Um, also, super impressed that finishing school still and um, uh, saving all this money. It's fantastic. So on the five twenty nine plan front, obviously the earlier that you save the less money you have to save to accomplish the goal. We traditionally just kind of back of the envelope calculation, say that it costs about a hundred dollars per month per kid from the day that they're born until they graduate high school to pay for one year of college. So if you want to pay for four years, you need to save about $400 a month. So the sooner that you do that, the better off that you, uh, that you are. So the short answer to make it even shorter than I already have, because now it's a long answer. So I'll shorten it now is sure you can open a 529, put yourself as a beneficiary and as the owner, put money into it. There's a great website called savingforcollege.com, which lists out all the different um, states as well as any tax benefits that you get for the state. Uh, if you don't get a tax benefit, you can kind of search for the higher rated plans uh, that are not in your state. If you happen to be in a higher cost one. And as far as like where to invest the money, I don't know why you wouldn't have that money invested the same as you invest your retirement assets. You have certainly it's not as long as retirement away, but it might be depending on when you have your kids. I mean, I've got a three year old and I'm 42, so I'll be retiring and sending my daughter to college at the same time. So, you know, that might be the case. But either way, a 20 year time horizon or a 25 year time horizon, it might as well be as the same time horizon as a 50 year time horizon. You know, you got a long time, but not sketchy at all. Open the 529 if you feel like doing it, put it in your own name, put your few, you know, a few bucks into it. Just remember that this money now is only tied up for college education or now they've got it for a couple of other things that you can use it for, but it's only for schooling and it's only for the person that's listed as the beneficiary their schooling. But so it, but if it, all of a sudden you change your mind and say, well, I don't have any kids, 
Yeah. And I want to use this for my retirement. There'll be a little tax, a little penalty perhaps, but that definition of who this could be used for, the people that you can change this to can be grandkids, nieces and nephews, sisters, brothers, parents. You know, there's a lot of different people that you can use it for. That's what I was wondering. What if he just had a separate bucket that was some diverse uh, exchange traded fund or mutual fund that is in the type of investment he'd have inside of a 529 plan, but he keeps it more flexible until he has somebody specific in mind because the amount of money you can put into a 529 plan is a fairly big amount. Now, the bad news is if that money makes money, there will be, again, a tax. He'll pay a capital gains tax to sell it and then to move that money over to the 529 plan later. But it seems to me that until there's a there is a kid, just having it separate but flexible might be a better idea. The major benefit of a 529 is the fact that that money grows tax deferred and is tax free later. The benefit of that benefit is the longer you can use that benefit, right? The more compounding that you have that's tax free, the more time you have between when that dollar goes in and then you take the dollar out, the greater that benefit is. So I would kind of go the other side of this. Why I agree with the flexibility that having it in a regular account and then maybe you change your mind or you lump sum it and say, well, here now I'm going to pay for my kid's college in one lump sum in the 529. One of the benefits of starting it now in that he might not have a child in his life for 15 years is that he'll he'll have a 15 year head start on that compounding and that tax free nature. So I think if that's something that you think that you are okay with, you know, separating from your life and just going, I've, this money is going away and it's got to go to college for somebody, which could be you, right? You can go take Spanish classes when you're 65 years old at university if you want. That counts as well. But I think the benefit of the tax rate, just like a Roth IRA, we hear from people and we've talked to people about why don't you start a Roth for your kid when they're like eight and use their babysitter money? Well, it's only $100 a year. Who gives a crap? Well, who, the reason it matters is because you're getting that extra, those extra doubles and it's tax free. So, I like it. If you got the money and you want to build the good habit now, it doesn't hurt anything. I was thinking as you were talking about going the other way, and I like that idea of using that shelter as long as possible. What I tell Stephen then that way is also if you don't use it and you're just interested in education, you could almost use this as a family education trust because he could he could use that if he's got siblings that have kids. You can use this for nieces and nephews, right? They qualify. Yeah, it's not unlimited in terms of the the spread that you can divvy that money up, but, but it's pretty broad based. Um, and there's some other rules that are presently enforced about how many times you can change it and that sort of stuff. It's once per 12 month period. So you just got to be aware of that. But for the time being right now, well, here's what I do. Extra hundred bucks, make it happen. Here's what I do. If I'm Steven then, and I don't have kids, then I just lord this over every family member. Just go and this have like a big event at your house where you announce who the next beneficiary is and you're going to leave it that way for 12 months because that's the rule. And then, you know, have a big ceremony, but then tell the kid, if you don't mind, like in front of everybody, 12 months from now, it's going to be somebody else. And then have another announcement 12 months later, whether you keep the beneficiary or not. Like, did they get to keep the money? Make it like a game show. That, like Survivor. That would be super fun. Just turn in your report card. Could you imagine... Like brothers and sisters would have to bring their kids to that because it's free money, but they'd hate it the whole way. We got to go over to Uncle Steven's house because he does this stupid thing. <laughs> we're we're going to find out. We're going to find out. And, and, and they're lobbying Steven like it's the uh, Academy Awards. You know how they all send all the all the people, yeah. all these gift baskets and stuff. Steven's getting free massages and golf games and and uh, trips to his favorite steakhouse so that Uncle Steven, see, that's a great idea. I think I think it's over the top now. I think you've gone just a bridge too far. Was that over the top? You think maybe? Smidge. Maybe. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Stephen. Maybe I overthought that. Oh, geez. Advice might be better. Head to uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail if you'd like us to go over the top with our answer to your question as well. That's going to do it for a Wednesday. Retirement 101 out of the way. Sorry, spoiler, uh, you probably can't uh, discharge those student loans for free. That was a bummer. Leslie coming down to the basement was a bummer. I already had my bankruptcy filing ready to go. <laughs> that, that all set up. <laughs> no free lunch. Again, Foil. how many episodes of this have we done? And exactly. we still haven't found the free lunch. So annoying. 
Big thanks to everybody hanging out with us. Also, a big thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. Mom likes to put many of these on the refrigerator. This is five stars from T-Storm 2000. I like that. The T-Storm 2000. Do you think they're a pro wrestler with that name? T-Storm 2000? I don't know. And in this corner, T-Storm 2000. Five stars. Awesomeness! Exclamation point. T-Storm writes, this is a great podcast of personal finance. No charts, no yelling, no banging on the table, and lots of humor to coincide with the information. Sound cons- oh, No, that all happens. We just don't record <laughs> we that don't, part. We all the gnashing and yelling about Stephen and his student loans and stuff. We yelled at him ahead of time. Uh, no. A sound concepts and laid back atmosphere it won't take long for you to be hooked unless you'd rather listen to Ben Stein talk in detail about Smoot Hawley. Great guests at round table, fees, glide pass, gas in the tank, runway behind you, and altitude above. Oh, that's awesome. I don't learn something every time I listen. We don't in parentheses. Even the ads are low-key. Joe and OG could get you interested. Then, bam, commercial. But no, their advertisers must like them because they horse around with their ads, too. Then there's the part of the show that doesn't exist. And Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, with trivia. Mom, I'm looking for my spot on the fridge. Well, guess what, T-Storm? You brought it, so... There's your spot on the fridge. Thanks for that. If you can share with people what they're getting into when they listen to Stacky Benjamins, uh, please do that wherever you listen and maybe mom will find it. All right. And then last, uh, OG and his team have the doors open. They're taking on clients for a short while here. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG to interface with him and his team and to find out how they can make your financial planning better. All right, that's going to do it, guys. Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Yeah, sure, Joe. I can only see out of one eye now that Cooper completely slashed me. But yeah, let me jump right on telling everybody what they should have learned while I'm fending off the wildlife here. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, First, crypto in your separately managed investment account. (laughs) Yeah, right. That's a good one. Uh, Oh, second... Take some advice from Michelle Kagan and take simple steps today to get your retirement plan rolling down the track. The process can seem overwhelming and complicated at first, but by focusing on taking simple steps today, your future self will thank you. But the big takeaway, don't try to answer Joe's mom's cat's questions. The cat has nothing to say. Nothing to say, Cooper. Get away from me, cat. God, you were one crazy ass animal big thanks to michelle kagan for stopping by the basement head over to our show notes page to find where you can get her new book retirement 101 thanks also to leslie tane for explaining this student debt discharge that probably won't end up happening have questions about your debt visit leslie and her team at tane law group we've got links on our show notes page. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes, not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
here's a movie I think a lot of people are interested in that I saw in the theater uh, about a week ago. This won the Golden Globe for Best Drama and uh, also is up for a few Oscars. This film is called 1917. In your own time, gentlemen. Must be something big if the channel's here. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion? Yes, sir. They're walking into a trap. Your orders are to deliver a message calling off tomorrow morning's attack. If you fail, it will be a massacre. We've got orders to cross here. That is the German front line. If we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. So from the director of Skyfall, one of my favorite uh, movies about James Bond, comes 1917. In this film about World War I and these two young soldiers, as you just heard, Colin Firth in one of many cameos by top stars you have seen. What's amazing about this film, by the way, OG? Lots of people you've seen before, but they're all in supporting roles. The two main characters are actors that have been in stuff. I mean, they're accomplished actors, but they're not A-listers that you've seen before. So it's interesting when you see Benedict Cumberbatch as the colonel at the front line. You see Mark Strong as uh, some type of a leader of of a unit uh, partway through the film. And there at the beginning, Colin Firth uh, setting up the action. They have to go get the brother and get this attack called off before it happens. This film is set not just in World War I, but it's also set up so that it's a bunch of long, long, long shoots. So half of the artistry of this movie, you remember the beginning of Birdman, where they're walking through all of these halls and tunnels? Did you see Birdman? No. Michael Keaton? No. Okay. Swing and a miss. This is set up something like that. Except- I'm Batman. <laughs> yes. But the whole movie, the entire movie is these long, long shoots. Like at the very beginning, it starts off with these two soldiers sitting and there's this beautiful field behind them. And then they get called to the general. So they start walking. And as they're walking, then you see them walk through the camp and there's other people sitting in the field, but they were the furthest out. So you didn't even notice that there was a camp. And then they go down where the sandbags are. And then and then that sandbag leads to a longer trench. And as they get closer to the general, the action around them becomes more and more. And scene after scene is like that in this movie. Movie's almost exactly two hours long, one hour and 59 minutes. I'd say out of an hour and 59 minutes, I was on the edge of my seat for about an hour and 57 minutes. It is uh, nonstop, not sure what's going to happen next. It is horrifying. It is harrowing. It is... Uh, what I can only imagine is a very realistic depiction of what it would have been like to be a part of what they at that time called the war to end all wars Mm -hmm. and a great film, just a great, great, great work of art. I thought they did a fantastic job on this movie. Not going to be my favorite movie because it was so intense, but I can see why it is a contender for one of the best movies of the year and why it's up for so many awards give me Ford versus Ferrari any day over this Uh, just because while there's a lot at stake, I think winning a race (laughs) is a lot less at stake. It's a lot easier to to stomach on a Tuesday afternoon than trying to uh, save the British army in the world war one. Yeah. Hey, if these two, if these two guys don't cross, uh, German lines and uh, make it to this group. Uh, all these people are going to lose their life. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was tough. Um, I was depressed the rest of the day. I won't spoil the ending, but that doesn't mean that there's a bad ending, but I think we can agree that uh, anytime you're watching something that is a depiction of war, you're not going to come out of the movie entirely happy. So 1917, big thumb up OG, big thumb up. 